take the first step towards online privacy. Get NordVPN. Ready to hop in the 6 4 and cruise around the blocks. There's a storm coming to the underworld and the heat is on. Take over the blocks and call the shots. It's time to hustle or get hustled. What's it gonna be? Stay sharp. It's a dog eat dog world out there. Don't let them catch you slipping. Only real gangsters thrive in the dope wars world. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Crypto Rich channel. I cover crypto and politics. I'm joined by Tom Luongo of Gold Goats and Guns and Rafi Faber from the Endgame Investor. And I've been wanting to get these two together for a long, long while because they're both sound money advocates, both libertarian. And I've learned loads from both of them about money, silver, gold, Bitcoin and economics. Hey, Tom. Hey, Rafi. Thank you so much for making yourselves available. Hey, Eric. How are you? I'm very, very well. Always thrilled to have you on, Tom, and you as well, Ruffy. And Ruffy, with you, I'm always thinking of some sort of excuse. How can I get Ruffy on? How can I get Ruffy on? I know. I'll get Ruffy on with Tom. Now, I'd like to start with, Ruffy, if you start saying where people can find you and your work, and then, Tom, you start where people can find you and your work, and then we'll see if there's anything to talk about because nothing's happening in the world at all. Yeah, it's boring. Nothing, nothing's happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, where you can find me? Uh, I'm the I'm the publisher of the Endgame Investor. It's uh, three or four times a week I write, cover mostly the precious metals markets from like a monetary philosophy sort of standpoint, and I focus on uh, a lot of the COMEX and what's going on, and and really trying to get people to understand in a deep sense uh, why gold and silver are money, and when you are when you when you acquire them, you're not really investing as much as you are exiting from the system in preparation for its collapse. Um, and if you, if you don't prepare, then, uh, you'll be stuck in the system while it collapses. It's like when there's an earthquake get out of the building, it's not the problem. The problem isn't that the ground is shaking. The problem is that whatever's on top is going to fall. Yes. So. Yes. And I'm going to have the link to your, I'm going to have links for you in the description below. And I invite people to go and check, check out Rafi. And also you're occasionally on Arcadia economics as well. Yeah. Yeah. Once a week I do a show for, uh, for Chris at Arcadia economics mm -hmm. Uh, a silver report where you know I go into what's going on in silver specifically, and I cover the uh, you know gold also. But he's a silver guy, so I go where his focus is, and um, we just review what's been happening in the week, and yeah, it's fun. Okay, great. All right, Tom. Do you want Hi, to um, I'm find you? Tom Luongo. The 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 website Tomluongo dot me. Uh, I do gold, goats, and guns, and uh, well, you know, in that order. Um, I, uh, with, I, like Rafi, I don't really believe that. I, I, I mix the markets along with the geopolitics and the domestic politics and try and fuse the two of them together because I, in, in these markets today, in this world we live in today, they're hyper-politicized. You can't really just focus on the markets without understanding what the people who are setting the policy which affect the markets are doing and the plumbing of, and the, plumbing of the, the system and everything else is all tied into that. So. Uh, like Rafi, though, I, I agree that you know, ultimately things like gold, to a lesser extent, in my my opinion, anymore, silver and Bitcoin are your hedges against the collapse of an existing system that is unsustainable. It is not investing; it is savings. Yes. It is you're building a pool of real savings. I'm an Austrian libertarian from that perspective. So to me, your personal, um, your personal stock of gold or whatever it is, you know, and, and, and in, this, in this sense, tangible assets are represent your savings. And that savings is what you use as a pool with which to build your any investment portfolio and any defensive hedges you're going to build on top of that. So yeah, it's a, it, 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 it's a core portfolio strategy. And do you want to mention your Patreon? Oh, sure. And I have a Patreon over Patreon slash gold, goats and guns where, you know, I write for people three to four times a week. Well, between private podcasts and private blogs covering the markets and the geopolitics. I just literally got finished with a, a post this morning for my uh, for my patrons. We do that as long as as well as we do a, a monthly investor newsletter with a, a bespoke portfolio um, ideas, a portfolio strategy to give people an idea of how to, you know, navigate all this stuff. Yep, so. and I should have a link. I'll have the links to Tom's stuff as well in the description. Oh, wait, why, by the way, I'll just say a word about my patron. I forgot the patron. Oh, uh, sure. I'm saying thing about his patron. My patron, my my patron is uh, Patreon is slightly different. I do a once a week um, commentary on a, a biblical themed commentary on economics and monetary policy and that kind of thing. Not like numerology and magic or anything like that. I try to take the more logical perspective. 
Um, for I just one example, for like I'm outside right now in my sukkah. It's the holiday of the Feast of Tabernacles right now for the Jews. So I'm sitting in my sukkah doing this interview. Um, and I commented last week that, uh, that Sukkot, that the holiday of Sukkot is really a celebration of the fall of communism. So we're interested in that kind of stuff, you know. Oh, very good. Well, we want the communists to fall. We certainly don't want the new communists to succeed. And by that, I'm referring to the WEF and Davos and stuff. And one of the things I would say to distinguish it, both of you, in a way, or your perspectives, is the way I see it is, Tom, you do the macroeconomics and following the money at the large scale and everything in euro dollar flows and all that, which I've learned from you. And then, Rafi, what you tend to do, I think, is focus more on what's happening with the markets. I remember listening to one of your videos about, I think it was about, um, you were talking about backwardation in all the commodity markets. This was about a year or so ago. Mm -hmm. And how that was playing out and what that would portend in terms of supply chain. It might have been one where you were talking about nickel or something. So you kind of hone right in on something particular. Mm -hmm. this now, before we started recording, I'm just letting everybody know, I'm record we're recording this on Monday, the 10th of October, 1730 British summertime, we started. And before I press the record button, I said to both of you in jest, I don't know what we're going to talk about because there's nothing happening in the world today, is there? <laughs> No, not at all. No, not, not at all. At all right. I, I, I have a, I have officially um, created a new Russian holiday. It's called Fafo Day. Fafo Day, and what does that stand for? You know what Fafo means, right? No, no. Fuck around and find out. Okay. Ukraine. This is Fafo Day. This is what happens when you bomb the, when you bomb critical Russian built infrastructure, and you upgrade from, you know, that's this is where we are. Um, right. You know, and you can it can either be a day of mourning in Ukraine or a day of celebration for Russian hardliners. But this is where we are. Oh, my God. Take your take your pick, because the Russians have now um, unleashed at, at least three, possibly four waves of kamikaze UAV caliber missile attacks across the entire civilian infrastructure of the country of Ukraine. The first wave around four o'clock my time, because uh, I started seeing stuff coming in through my telegram, the telegram feed around four thirty was uh, around 200 caliber missiles in the first wave, and they're still going on. As of 11.30, when I was working on a, a post about this, just to give everybody an update, yeah. and, what I, and where I thought we are going to go, because we need to know what that's going to mean. And then, of course, if this is happening on a day when the U.S. markets are closed, and market liquidity around the world is a little light, because there's no U.S. market, um, we're starting, we're interesting that we're seeing some very, uh, that we're seeing some pretty, pretty solid or interesting moves and in things like German debt, Italian debt, and whatnot. UK wow. gold market was crazy today. You got to get that. Gold is down $35. Mm. Right? Gold broke down below about 16, yeah, 16, $16.65 on the right? Wall Street's open today, though, right? I didn't think they were. No, it's Labor Day. I'm going to stay in the United States. I think, it's like a, I think it's like a half holiday where banks are closed, but but stocks are trading or something like that. I don't know. I've been out of the world for the last 24 hours. I've, I've been on a holiday, so I don't even... I, I, it's news oh, yeah. to me. No, they, no you're right. Economy. I'm sorry. Yeah, the DAO is open. But yeah, it is a bank holiday. Mm. So. Okay. Okay. Well, listen, I'm going gonna, gonna to go, go from one to the other. Tom makes... But the bond market... But Rafi, the bond markets aren't open. We're still getting the same exact quotes from we got from Friday. So the U.S. Oh, okay. bond markets... Are, yeah, the U.S. bond markets are. But the, I guess the equity markets are. So tomorrow is going to be a very interesting day. All right. Okay, so Rafi, anything you want to say about what's been happening in, or did, I mean, did you know about the assault, the attacks on Kiev and civilian no. infrastructure? <laughs> okay. No, I, I, did, I didn't. I mean, I, I just turned on my computer like 45 minutes ago, checked my email, responded to different subscriber questions, etc. And I saw something on Zero Hedge that Russia was bombing a bunch of things, but I didn't think it was anything out of the ordinary, so I didn't look at it, but <laughs> maybe it is. Uh, it, was, it was a major escalation. The Russian Security Council held a big meeting. Okay. Their afternoon, just you know, our morning, and Putin's response was, um, "We're done with the West. There is no, there is no potential to repair our relationship. It's over." Um, and now, you know, this is what you get for what you've done. And okay. his response to the Kerch Strait Bridge was to not go any farther than targeting Ukraine. So it's going to be very interesting. Oh, and Belarus, by the way, is now officially in, in the fight. F because sure. Lukashenko came out, the, the Belarusian president Lukashenko came out with very colorful words, as always, from that guy. He's very, he's, he's fascinating. And um, 
said, oh, yeah, no, the, the Ukrainians have been massing you know, 15, 20,000 troops on the border. They were going to invade us. So, you know, a lot of these missile strikes on western, northwestern Kiev came from Belarus. And the Russian Union state, and remember that Belarus and Russia upgraded their um, relationship after the attempted uh, color revolution in Belarus in 2020 to that of the Union state. Like every time Victoria Newland tries to overthrow somebody in Eastern Europe or one of the Russian satellites, she always winds up getting exactly what she didn't want, which is an upgrade of the Russian satellites coming back home to, to Russia because they were hoping to get rid of Lukashenko. And what they wound up with was a stronger relationship between Belarus and Russia. Belarus has practically given up their own currency. They now all use the Russian rule. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the Union State's a big deal, guys. It's a okay. Big deal. You attack Belarus, you're attacking Russia. Yeah. Okay. Okay, a bit like Article 5 with NATO. Uh, Ruffy, anything, anything you want to comment or get caught on or ask about? With um, anything you want to say about the gold and silver markets? Well, I, 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 again, in the in the very small amount of time I had to check in what was going on in the world before you know I turned on Zoom, uh, I did see that yeah, gold is down what thirty, forty bucks, something big, down to sixteen seventy, and gold stocks are pretty much even. Um, I, that technically that that seems to suggest that the you know we're we're skirting a bottom, we're just like skirting over the sixteen seventy bottom, which is you know a nice number. Right. It's around where the triple bottom was. It doesn't seem like it's going to break at this point because if the stops were there, they would have already been broken. Uh, I agree. Who knows where they are? Who knows where they were? But uh, if if gold's going to sell out for thirty, forty bucks, and gold stocks are going to be steady, then uh, it seems like uh, it's a good time to start going back in if you've got some uh, if you've got some cash to use. Um, yeah. No, I what well, yeah, I, I'm the no argument actually that not having not looked at the, the gold stock index because for the most part, I actually don't even. Look at most stock indices anymore. I, I mostly just follow the, the bigger markets, the euro, the currencies, the bonds, the commodities themselves, and then you know whatever the market. But if there's a, a di- if there's a divergence at this point, at this moment in time, oh, then this is just a dollar piggy bank rate, as always in the gold yeah. futures market. As you know, at this point, you know the the dollar's up strong today. It's at back the USDX is back up over 113. Uh, the euro is down back below 97 cents. The uh, the the yen is pushing off. 146. The British pound is down to a dollar, dollar ten. You know, you can see the 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 the, the situation here. And I, I would think, under a situation like this, that as always, we're dealing with a shortage of dollar liquidity worldwide, thanks yeah. to the Fed, and that's lay, and that and that's just laying itself out. So yeah, watching for divergences like Rafi just noted, in terms of where investors are put, taking their money. There are the people out there who are going, oh my God, I need dollars. To get through the week, and then there's the rest of the people who are going. Yeah, this is a buying opportunity. Yeah. Case in point, I bought gold this morning. Like I've been up since I had to take my my wife's not feeling very well. I had to take my daughter to the school this morning. So I said, I've been up since five thirty. So <laughs> like my time. So I've already been up seven hours. Uh, yeah, I've I've already had a very busy morning. Like so. Uh-oh. So on that and on that are, point on that point, there's something interesting. Um, that, uh, you know, a lot of people in the, in the gold and silver, you know, buying community, gold bugs, silverbacks, whatever you want to call them, uh, you know, we see this environment like, oh, gold's not acting as an inflation hedge and we're all, you know, hot and bothered about it. And we're like, you know, getting all these negative emotions. But like, I have a friend that, I, that, that I learn with every morning, British guy, and he earns pounds. Like he, he lives in Israel, but he works remotely and he earns pounds as income. And he's having, he's having some trouble. Because the pound is down so much, and he's he's you know he just had a new baby, and he's have all, all these expenses and the doula and whatever, so he's like he's like Rafi, look, I don't want to do this, but uh, you know I, I need to sell some gold, and and I had to I had to tell him where I had to tell him where he could sell it, uh, because he's in a liquidity crunch. So like it makes sense that that it some some gold holders, even if they're not you know capitulating, they have they need liquidity, so they'll sell, and that's that's probably that's. Partly why gold price is under attack now, because this is what happens. Okay, okay. As a layperson who doesn't have the depth of knowledge that both of you have with the money markets and gold and silver, I, I haven't looked at the price today. But I thought when I read about the attacks on the civilian infrastructure in Ukraine by the Russians, okay, this is an escalation in the war, and what happens is people rush to gold as a safe haven asset. But what you're saying, Tom, is that the the people are the world is so short of dollars. 
that they're selling their gold. Yes. See, in, in times past, there was always the war premium. They pumped the, 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 they'd allow the gold market to run on news of war. Like if you go back to like the Iraq war and, Iraq, yeah. and Afghanistan and things like that, you'd always see gold pump 25, 30, 40 dollars, the gold bugs. And then Martin Armstrong come out and the gold bugs are always wrong because they'd pump 40 bucks and then it would collapse. So you get a pump and dump in gold that would last 24 to 48 hours, maybe as long as a week, depending on what. Now it's the exact opposite because we're in a dollar crunch. Because look, the way I see it, 14 years of ZERP, zero bound interest rates, zero interest rate policy, ZIRP, you know, left the world biblically short dollars because so many people borrowed after the, the, the 2008 financial crisis overseas in dollars. This is why Turkey has gotten blown up because Turkish corporates all bought U.S. denominated debt at, you know, good rates because they couldn't get good rates out of in, in the lira. So they can get 6% on a business loan in dollars, but it was 26% in Turkish lira. Well, guess what? You know, what are you going to buy your, your debt in? And as long as the Fed was going to stay at the zero bound, then this was a good bet. And a lot of people did this, and there's a lot of carry trades, and there's a lot of, of, of financial structure that ex exists out there that's based on that old policy. Now with the Fed aggressively raising rates, now we've got people in serious trouble. I was, I mean, we were talking about this on my private Slack server this morning, and um, about an art about some analysis from Deer Point Capital about um, uh, currency FX swaps and why. You know, this isn't that you know, that there that you know his disagreement with my argument that we're that the Fed is actively trying to drain the euro dollar markets, and in a sense, and um, I'm like, well, yeah, but the FX swap market, if you look at it, is actually confirming exactly what I'm saying. There's a dearth of euro dollars. The FX swap market is decoupled from the uh, the the ratio of the the ECB to the Fed's balance sheet and the whole and and the markets are blown and these old relationships are all blowing up and he didn't have an answer for that in his article but I did five minutes after reading the article I go this is why so it's actually confirming exactly what I've been saying in many ways that the why we think the Fed is raising rates is not necessarily to staunch the the staunch the, the put the kibosh on inflation what the Fed is doing is getting re, is regaining control over its own monetary policy. In an era where they don't have, they don't have to have where U.S. debt is no longer indexed to LIBOR, and that, and, and the, um, and the markets still haven't adjusted to all of this. Gold is just caught in crossfire, and so in a in a dollar illiquid in an illiquid dollar environment, gold is the easiest thing for people to sell. It just is. Either right. you look at the spot market or you look at the futures market, and so especially in the West, where the futures market is all paper. And people use it as a dollar piggy bank or as a dollar hedging strategy. It's clear that that's the one thing that they're always going to sell. Now, the question I have now, and I and Rafi, I'd like to, I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say about this because I don't follow open interest on the LBMA. I don't follow the COMEX and whatnot, which is the following: I'm worried about volatility washing of liquidity in these markets. Like I'm seeing it all over the oil market. Like we have people who are in power hot openly hostile to the price of oil. So if you want to wash out you know, the small players in markets, then the easiest way to do that is to whipsaw the market against its fundamentals, right? Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that in oil. The oil's fundamentals are unbelievably bullish. And yet, up until last week, oil was in a, a three-month downtrend with mm -hmm. massive amounts of volatility. Wiping out guys on the, you know, wiping out spec longs on the high and the low, on the long and the short end of the low. And every, and I've heard, I've heard multiple reports of people going, you know what, I'm, out. I'm not going to trade oil anymore. Yep. So the big question now is that they're trying to volatility wash out a lot of people in gold, or is this just pure desperation? I don't know if you're seeing anything like that in the, the gold and silver markets, because that would be fascinating if you do. Well, Rafi, before you answer that, before you answer that, I just want to translate some of what Tom said. For you know those that don't have his insight and knowledge into the money markets, like myself, I'm learning, right? Which is essentially, Tom, what you're saying is that the big players in the oil markets are making it go up and down lots and lots and lots and lots, and it's shaking. Remember, we have hands. yes, we have computers trading these markets, not humans. So they can they can key the key, they can key the the, al the algorithms to go to overcorrect in one direction versus undercorrect in the other direction, depending on the headlines that the algorithms read in the in 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 the press. The, the, the press writes blatantly false headlines with the right keywords in them to get the algorithms to go, to go ballistic. Craig Hemke and I talked about this in, in my podcast. And Craig's a, Turk Ferguson, Craig Hemke is a, another 
long suffering gold futures trader, right? And uh, built an entire, I, I think, uh, entire very solid business trying to explain the the inner workings of the gold market to people. So Craig and I talked about this, you know, uh, a couple of months ago, and it's just since then I've just been watching it in the oil markets. So what happens is, you know, because you know, guy, because the play in the futures market, you're always leveraged because you put you post X amount of collateral versus your position. If the mar- if the market moves against your bet, regardless of whether or not two hours from now your bet's going to be right, you can get margin called out because That's your collateral right. gets eaten up. And you either have to post collateral or get or get washed or get forcibly washed out of the market. You know, at least on a day-to-day basis, but not, maybe not on an hourly basis. Do you understand what I mean? Yep, yep. And that, that's what I mean by volatility washing. You're washing these guys out of the market by playing the, by forcing them in and out of their positions based on you know egregious volatility. And yep. and before and, the and before okay. Russia invaded Ukraine, the oil chart is clear. Like volatility in oil is tripled on a on a weekly basis, tripled in the oil markets in the Brent crude markets. I don't I don't care much about WTI. I, I usually just watch Brent, but Yep. Roughly. Give you an idea. So sorry, Arvi. Yeah, go ahead. There's two things. It's okay. There's a, um yeah, you focus on very different aspects of me, so I'm learning a lot also. Um mm-hmm. so if we're gonna go back to the COMEX on uh, open interest, um there's three things that I'm seeing that I'm seeing there. First of all, there's um I don't know if I am able to share here. Can I if Hold I on, let me give you permission. Hold on a second. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um well while you're getting that fixed, uh the the thing that I want to okay, share. Yeah. Uh, now I can. Okay, I'm clicking it. Let's uh, right here. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, this is from Gold Charts R Us. So at the right. end of this chart here, where I'm where I'm you know making a little rectangle with my uh, little right. plus magnifying glass here. This is the gold price. It was at like sixteen twenty over here. Now it's up to about seventeen hundred. Doesn't count today's drop to sixteen seventy. But let's just take this. We right. have a, a you know a rise of sixteen twenty to seventeen hundred and a corresponding fall in open interest from looks like four hundred seventy thousand to four hundred thirty three thousand. So it means mm-hmm. contracts were closed and the price went up. So that's you know that's that's technically a short squeeze. It's not a big short squeeze, but that's that's what happened. And I also can tell right. you that um, that I I subscribe to some uh, market historians. Uh, you know, just a few ones that have the right fundamentals. They understand what money is. They're not just purely looking at chart patterns, but they trade the futures. And a lot of them have been knocked out and they have no idea what's going on. Their, their systems aren't working and they're just getting frustrated and they're bowing out, you know, wisely because their their systems aren't working. Um, and that's okay. But I, but, but look, t- fundamentally, I'm not worried about the gold traders. Yeah. Gold, fu- that's gold derivatives traders, futures traders that are, that are, you know, playing liquidity games. I don't care if they get knocked out. It's it's only going to affect me, you know, very temporarily or in the very short term. Sure. Um, I'm a stacker. That's what I do, and I guide stackers. And and the futures, the futures traders, they're going to affect us. But I'm not going to go running to a bullion to a to a bullion dealer and saying, "Oh, take buy my coins because gold went down thirty bucks today." I don't care. And most and and you know, if I'm if I'm in a liquidity crunch and I need money to pay my bills, yeah, it's a different issue. But that's nothing right. to do with the daily movements of gold or silver or whatever. Right. Um, and finally, the the other thing that 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 I've noticed is that the the COMEX. Oh wait, oh let me let me just try to tri- uh, hold on. I'm going to actually well, there was one more thing before you go before you go any further. I was going to say the entire chart that you put up was fascinating because mm-hmm. open interest on the COMEX has dropped. Was that a weekly chart or a daily chart? That, that was the six month chart. So it was daily. It was daily okay, going so out. Daily, six look at look at the look at the open interest on the COMEX in general. It's mm-hmm. down. From around five hundred eighty to six hundred thousand contracts down into the four thirties. Yeah, yeah, go, that's exactly what I was talking about. It's very down. It's way down. Yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly what I was talking about. Which is that there's less. And the point I was trying to make was that once there's no liquidity in the market, once there's not a lot of open interest, it's easier to actually get whipsaws mm-hmm. because bought large players can move the market against you know easily because there's no open interest, there's no liquidity, and then the okay. bid ask spread starts to rise more. And more. So we're this seeing is the it second Bitcoin. thing I well, wanted well. to share. This is the second thing I wanted to share. I put this mm. on the Endgame Investor um, last week, and this is this is the total transparent. Do you see it here? Am I sharing? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. This yep. is the, this is the total transparent silver holdings for all funds. It includes uh, down here. You can see all of them: Comex, Tocom, CF. I don't know what half these things are. SLV, Gold Money. So some of them I know, some of them I don't. But it's all this the stored silver that we know that. So it supposedly backs the, all the paper funds in the world that we know about. And if you see here, um, in 2020, we had a huge influx, which means that a lot of people were buying paper silver and investing in these funds, expecting Armageddon, the end of the world. And now all this silver is leaving. We've lost 165 million ounces 
2022 year to date, and that is by far a record. I mean, the silver was oh, draining yeah, yeah. Than ever before, and on the LBMA, it's also draining. Um, and I can uh, I can go really quickly to that the LBMA here. I have it bookmarked. Um, should load in a second, but we're we're seeing this phys- the physical metal leaving the um, leaving the storehouses because the price is so low, and the trade and the futures traders are messing up the price, and that's okay. Let them do it. Um, Let's see here. We see yeah, silver. Yeah. All this LBMA. Look at the silver supply. Uh, it was at one point one eight billion. Yeah, I, yep. And now it's down to eight hundred seventy-one thousand, eight hundred seventy-one million. It's it's really draining. Yeah. No. It, and it's really fascinating because it, we go all the way back to you know. I mean, it was some legendary stuff in the in the gold and silver markets. We go back to the old uh, posts uh, on the uh, the FOFOA from 20 years ago, talking about the end of the paper gold and silver trade, that at some point they're going to drain the LBMA and or the COMEX, and then the paper price is going to go to zero, and the um, and the physical price is going to go to AIDA. And it's at that moment is then where we're going to go, we're going to transition from a paper market as the price setter to a physical market being the price setter. Right now, the, the physical market is the price taker in gold and silver, and, yeah. or, and has been for years. And for the most part, even in oil and other commodities, this is how they've kept. This is how the, the 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 markets have become the way they are, and why the people who, in my mind, are attempting to destroy the world or take over the world have been um, funding and, and keeping their power base in play by over financializing these incredibly important markets and then leaving the primary producers on a cost plus business model. And they take all the vig in between. Mm-hmm. They take all the real profit. And the gold, you know, gold miners have, it's always been that. And it used to be worse in the gold industry when the only form of bank financing they could get was non recourse loans to go back 15, 18 years ago. Today, you've got, um, uh, yeah. you've got instruments like wheat and precious metals and Franco Nevada and all these royalty companies, Royal Gold and whatnot. They act as the banking system for the gold and silver markets so that. They put the upfront capital for the exploration and development, and then they take a, a piece of the back end for their initial investment, as opposed to going to the bank, having to go to the bank for a 10% loan, and the bank then trading against that position and destroying the, the cap table of the, of the mining company. Like, this is like, this is, this is just, you know, that's classic stuff in the, in the gold market. The, thankfully, the gold market and the, the precious metals market has actually shifted away from that old business model years ago. Um, and now it's a much healthier investing environment for you know new uh, new new production but now to do that now we just suppress the price so that they, these guys the, at the when they finally do make a mine or build a mine they don't make any money because they keep the price right above the extraction level so we're talking you know like what's what's the average cost to pull an ounce of gold out of the ground at 95 dollars a barrel of oil you think it's you think if you think it's a, a thousand bucks you're nuts for most producers it's 1500 mm-hmm. yep. you know I'll, Especially after their oil hedging, which they're usually hedged out in time about six months, you know, if the price of oil jumps a lot, you won't see it in their uh, you won't see it in their uh, in their earnings report for two quarters. But then it'll start, then the then the energy costs will start showing up in their in their I mean, it, it's and you can play all that you can play all those timelines. It's crazy. So I don't recommend people. I don't recommend anybody. I don't recommend that to people. I just try and teach them the structure of these markets and then let them. Do what they're, and then pass them off to somebody who is going to give them real trading advice. That's not what I'm. That's not what I do. Okay, Ruffy. Yeah. What, what? Anything you want to say about what Thomas said, or as we develop this conversation? And at some point, I do want to link it back to what's happening in Europe and Ukraine and Russia, and how it might roll out with the physical market in the physical exchange in Shanghai, and also the proposed physical gold exchange in Moscow. Okay. Um, so there, there is something I can say to try to link all this up. Um, mm-hmm. I saw this Bloomberg article it was two days ago um, that uh, I think the LME, the London Metal Exchange, the base metal futures, uh, the the one where the nickel fiasco happened in March, uh, they are they are contemplating banning all Russian base metals from 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 backing contracts in the LME. So uh, I mean. That's about ten percent of the world's base metals, and they're they're thinking of just like saying Russia can't be part of the LME anymore. So then, th- their theory is that if they do that, they'll save themselves uh, because nobody wants Russian metal. But but may- maybe that's true. 
but like still effectively if you ban 10 if you if you like theoretically if, if you take the extreme of this example and, and let's say the lme says we're going to ban all metal from our storage and nobody can put base metals in our in our exchange anymore at all then what happens to the paper contracts well the answer is they become completely irrelevant so what sets the price if the lme bans all physical metals from their storehouses then the physical market takes over and just ignores the lme because it doesn't matter anymore so if if you're going to do something less extreme and ban 10% of the metal because it's from Russia, then the paper price is just going to become less relevant and the physical premiums are going to go up. And you'll, you'll see, you know, the, the physical market is slowly but surely going to take over the, the paper markets. And you're seeing that in silver premiums and physical silver premiums, which are 40% now, which is the 2008 record high for junk silver. You're seeing it in gold, which the... Uh, I think Krugerrands and, and Buffaloes went from like 3% to like 6% last month, just suddenly jumping. It must have been some kind of rumor. But yeah, the physical markets haven't taken control yet, but they're they're on the way and they're getting stronger. And uh, eventually paper markets are going to be completely irrelevant. And how many dollars you can make trading stupid gold futures is not going to matter because you can't buy anything with them. Yeah, right. no, actually, Tom, no. Tom, 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 hold on a second. Tom, hold on a second. Before you respond, just a few things. By base metals, which metals are you referring to? Like copper, nickel? Uh, Nick, nickel, copper, um, molybdenum, I think. So, yeah, things like that. Aluminum, yeah. lead. Yeah, so things that are used in industrial production. So yeah. the LME thinks that if we don't hold them, then Russia won't be able to sell them to anybody and no, because nobody needs, nobody in the world needs copper or lead wait, or aluminum. Wait, this, what's, this the per, what's the, okay, no, Rich, let's go back to the beginning. What's the primary use of a, of a commodities future market? To coordinate production and supply and demand through time, I'm going to need. I'm a. I'm a consumer. I'm a an aluminum smelter. I'm going to need X number of tons of aluminum six months from now. I want to lock in today's. I want to lock in some predictability in the price I'm going to pay by buying six. You know, by buying X number of months out into the future. You destroy the structure of that market. You destroy any ability of these commodity markets to produce and coordinate their their supply through time. And place. It's literally an attack on the structure of all of these markets. It's no different than going in and, and paying farmers not to farm. It's no different than blowing up food processing plants or pipelines. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. Okay? That's, so the that's, LME that's, coming out and saying that is a classic example of what will happen is, of course, what Rafi said is right. But then the opposite side of that is that what's stopping Dubai or Moscow or Shanghai or Singapore or anybody else from starting up their own exchanges if they've got the liquidity and they've got the and they've got the the the, the backers and, and everybody and everything else? Yeah, that, now, that's what's going to happen over the course of the next fifteen years. All that business that used to go through the city of London is going to flow into other is going to yeah. flow into other markets. Yeah. Now, listening to Rafi and as a as a lay person, right? Um, it occurred to me like another. Of those, we're going to get Russia by freezing ourselves to death. Yeah. Then Russia will be sorry. <laughs> we're, we're going to get Russia. We're going to show Russia by denying ourselves their fertilizer to grow us grow food for ourselves. It's just, it's oh my god! I can't. It's just it is vandalism. Wait, like you and said, then when, and then and then when we and then when the Russians actually give give the West their cook their PR cookie by saying yes, the Ukrainians can ship and export grains out through Odessa. What comes out in the last 24 hours? The Russians proving flat out that the Ukrainians are are the the boats that are bringing in stuff into Odessa isn't stuff that the Ukrainians need. It's what happens. So they're using the, the Ukrainian grain tra trade through the port of Odessa to move NATO weapons into Ukraine to fight the Russians. And the Russians are like, that's enough of that shit. And they just and they started bomb and they, and that's part of it. And Odessa was absolutely targeted this morning, including military uh, installations on the border with Moldova. Because, again, Romania and Moldova are, 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 mass, are doing uh, military exercises on the, on, the, on the border near Odessa because, obviously, the Russian enclave of Transnistria with the 20,000 troops that are there, they're, they're planning on overrunning that. They're just trying to mass up on the border before they, 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 we go to a hot kinetic war. The question is whether or not Putin's going to give them the Kazis Belli and Moldova even came out this morning and tried to play that game by saying, three of your caliber missiles pass over our airspace. Oh, by the way. Like, so, that, so that came out this morning, too. Like, and, you know, it, of course, Moldova said that because Moldova's, you know, a, a Soros-backed regime in, in, in Moldova trying to get, trying to come up with some excuse 
to go, Article 5, NATO, come in and save us. And claim the moral high ground. What else is new? Brits yeah. have been trying to do this for seven months, guys. Yeah, so basically what Every we said other day. nothing's happening in the world. It's all boring. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, my, exactly, my friend. <laughs> Rafi, any, I don't know um, how much you follow what's going on in Ukraine, Russia, and Europe, and the larger markets there. Any comment you want to make and how you see this might be rolling out? Uh, between Ukraine and Russia? And how it's going to affect um, the money markets? Wait, oh, money, money markets with Russia? Uh, well, the the one thing I do understand, I always go back to the monetary focus because I try to I try to not comment too much on war and geopolitics, other than just I know that inflation and war goes together go together. They're both theft. You know, governments steal steal money to go to war, and inflation is stealing money, so they're just gonna have to steal money faster. Uh, you know that <laughs> that's what happens. Um, but if if Russia's uh, monetary policy of the past since about 2000 since gold bottom in 2000 if if the numbers on trading economics are right and they've been stockpiling gold ever since uh and basically keeping their gold supply in line with their money supply which functional means they're on a gold standard they never announce it or anything but if you're if you're going to ex expand your gold reserves at the same rate that you're expanding your ruble supply you're backing your currency 100 percent with gold just that's what you're doing um and really all russia would have to do is say you know, the 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 ruble is exchangeable for a certain amount. And I know some people on our side say this isn't possible. I think it's possible because all you need to do is have people believe that there is 100 percent backing and it, it should work. That's what a gold standard is. You don't actually need the metal. You just need the, the, the metal as a measure. And but, yeah, eventually people steal from that and it doesn't doesn't work. So it wouldn't it wouldn't last forever. But um, it would it would pull the rug from out, out from the dollar. And um, does Putin really understand that? I'm not sure, but oh, I, uh, I, the market I, will organize it in some way and it'll come to that anyway. I, I believe that, I, I can tell you flat out that I absolutely believe having studied Putin for 10 years, that he does understand this. The structure he would, um, he would implement would be similar to what China has done with Yuan, which is to have an onshore Yuan and an offshore Yuan. Eventually, the Chinese are going, to, are going to also let everybody know exactly how much gold they actually have, which is far more than what they say they have. And then, um, and then, at, 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 and then, effectively, the onshore Yuan would be convertible to gold, but the offshore Yuan would not. In the same way that the sa same same thing is going to happen with the ruble, I think is where is where Russia goes with this. And it, again, the the rumor is, and I believe the rumor, is that, look, the, the official gold holdings of the, uh, and nothing I, you said, by the way, Rocky, I disagree at all. You're absolutely right. What I would say is to Ryan, everybody, that Russia has kept their um, gold holdings in their FX reserves as around 20% of M2, which is very high. Okay. Um, and that's about the level that countries usually get, and then they stop accumulating gold. Um, so and when the Russians were at that point about a year and a half ago, that's what happened. Then they had to inflate in order to deal with the, um, you know, deal with the, the the war and everything else. And now they're now they're buying now they're just buying more gold. And both Russia and China between them produce about six hundred tons of gold a year domestically. None of that leaves the uh, not not much of it leaves the actual market. Like some of it winds up at the at winds up at Swiss refiners and the LBMA and whatnot, but none of it leaves China. Not 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 an ounce. So it's all being bought up domestically and whatnot. So, yes, they're going to move towards a, 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 a gold convertibility for their local currency at some point in the future. And, but they're not going to do so until they need to. And the bigger question is, when is the day that's going to come that the Fed needs a higher gold price? Everybody who's struggling with no dollars right now needs a higher gold price that has any gold reserves. In my mind, the, 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 the block that needs a higher gold price to offset its impending sovereign debt crisis is the European Union. They've got vast gold reserves across all of, your, all of the EU 27 member countries, something like about 12, 13,000 tons of gold. And a low gold price hurts them as German debt falls in price, as Italian debt falls in price and rises in yield. And they've got all this stuff not only on their balance sheet. Go look at the ECB's balance sheet. Eighty percent of it is made up of European sovereign debt. 
That sounds stable. So if that, if that, if that collapses in price by 40%, their ECB's effective mark-to-market balance sheet has dropped by 35%. So they need a higher gold price off. They, they need a higher gold price off sentence. That's part of yeah, what Basel III is all about. That, that's 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 uh, I guess one way to look at it. Um, I, I say basically the same thing you're saying from uh, yeah. just looking at the same thing from a different angle. I mean, I, one of one of the guys that I really I don't I don't look up to many to many people. I look uh, across at them because we're all looking at the Fair same enough. thing and we're, we're like we're like getting it from different angles. But one guy that I look up to is uh, is Daniel Oliver of Mermican Capital. Because his his knowledge of monetary history is just it's the best that I've ever seen, except for maybe Murray Rothbard himself. Um, and and what Daniel Oliver says of Mermican is that yeah you're talking about who needs a, a higher gold price, but in in basically from 1978 to 1980, you know what was what was happening was that the market was forcing uh, as as the Fed was hiking and, and killing the value of the paper on its balance sheet, the market was forcing gold higher and higher and saying we have no faith in these bonds. And the amount of gold on the on the Fed's balance sheet was rising at, as a percentage of the, of the of the uh, of the dollars on the balance sheet to about 130 percent coverage, which is like way beyond. You know, it means we're totally lost in faith in the dollar. And um, so he's saying we didn't. The, it's not that we instituted a gold standard or that it was instituted from top down in 1980. It was that the free market was forcing the dollar onto a gold standard in 1980 because it had no faith in the bonds. Uh, until you know, until price inflation finally cooled down, and and uh, the, you know, it was it was almost dollar Armageddon in January nineteen eighty. It was almost there. It was like <laughs> this time we're gonna Agreed. this time we're gonna hit it. Yeah. No, I and and I one hundred percent agree with you, except that I think that the Fed may have a way out of it. You, get, you think the Fed has a way out? I do. What is it? What is that? Well, if they're gonna let, they, they have to let the dollar. They have to let. The, the the dollar rise in value relative to all the other currencies, right? And eventually they're going to let the they're going to let the, the, the gold price start to rise because they because the free market's going to take over. Either we drain the paper market as we've already discussed, right? They're allowing they have to allow interest rates to rise in order to get in order to attract capital. The larger the the, the rising dollar is also um, going to create uh, you know uh, is going to mitigate some of the, the effect of that. And the dollar liabilities. We can throw gold out onto the yield curve. Judy Shelton, when she was under um, consideration to become part of the FOMC, which, by the way, John McCain and Kamala Harris both fist bumped when they blocked her nomination to the Federal Reserve Board. Judy Shelton is an old gold bug. She let it slip in, an, in a podcast with Grant Williams uh, about six months ago that when when Trump and Mnuchin were talking about 50 and 100 year bonds, remember that early in the Trump presidency? Well, maybe we'll just issue 50 and 100 year bonds in order to be able to roll out some of the debt and keep the and keep the, the servicing costs low, right? Especially while interest rates were at zero. The part they didn't talk about was what Judy Shelton let slip was that they were talking about issuing those bonds with a five with some percentage, probably five percent gold redemption cost. Meaning, at the end of the bond, when the bond is paid back, you're going to get five percent. You, you have the option of getting five percent of your capital back in, in Treasury gold. Now, if you do that, then the Fed is actually incentivized to allow the price of gold to rise because they can rate, they can issue those 50, 100 year bonds at like a two percent nominal dollar yield, and then if they allow the gold price to rise, the investors will, you know, will get paid back on the back end. And that's the brilliant strategy. And if the Fed doesn't do it, the Russians and or the Chinese and or the Indians will do it. Someone's going to do it. And then the Fed will have to follow suit. So at some point, the Fed will want a higher gold price in order to deal with this. Because at some point, and very soon, remember, in the middle of 2023, there's a massive uh, debt rollover that the United States is facing. Was it 20% of outstanding debt has to be rolled over next year? That Something like some, some crazy amount has to be rolled over next year. So And it's going to be rolled out at higher rates because the Fed has raised interest rates. And I think the Fed's not going to stop raising interest rates until they've broken the ECB. Well, my honest opinion. So if you think of it, if you think of it in those terms, that, that's the way out. And that's the way you deal with the unfunded liabilities. But you also have to engender a political revolt here at home, which stops the spending. And we have to go back to 2019 or 2018 spending levels or 2017 spending or pre-Trump spending levels. Cut 15% from the federal budget. 
which we could do, and then and, and to deal with the, the, the rising uh, debt servicing costs that'll happen in the interim. But okay, it has so, to come with a concomitant political revolution here in the U.S. I don't know that we have the stomach for it, but that's the way out. Now, whether so, it's going to happen or not, hey, hey, you know, I, I'm throwing darts at the dart. My, my, response, my response to that is that, okay, so you're talking about a, a way that they could do it. And, yeah, if, if A leads to B and B leads to C and this happens, then there's a way out. Except my problem is, and where, where I think they get stuck, is that when, when they do this, and they, they they go on this plan to try to you know restore faith in the monetary system or whatever however you want to call in a sense what you just described. Um, at some point they're going to end up in a 2008 situation where all the banks are like you've got to you've got to you've got to reverse course right now or we're all going to collapse and the entire pyramid that we've been building since 1971 is going to come toppling in on itself. It's like it's like it's sort of like you're describing like okay so they're building the Tower of Babel and they're building their building and they're on floor 1000 and then and then. You know, they just decide to like slow down and keep the in and keep the tower. But that's not how that's not how I see it happening. I don't I don't see that these people are that smart. Uh, that uh, that they know exactly what they're doing. They just seem to me to be haphazardly keep building, pyra- you know, layer on layer of the pyramid, and eventually it's just going to fall over because there's nothing they can do. Maybe you're right. I don't know. But to me, I I, 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 I presented that to you because I know that you probably hadn't heard it before. I've been talking about this for months. I I just one other one other thing I just want to I want to point out that this this is again, you know, I I don't expect I I I would not expect all of that to 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 I I expect pushback. I always do. So and 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 healthily, it's it's all health. It's all good. I'm not you know in no way, manner, shape, or form do I consider this confrontational. I I don't. This is not. This is just analysis. Sure. So the. The, the 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 next phase of that is to say you're you're correct, but here's the thing: in 2008, it was a domestic creation of the domestic housing. Now, I'm not saying that the United States isn't going to like get there, as George C. Scott put it in Doctor Strange. I thought, oh, you're not going to get our hair mussed. Like it's not like we're not going to have to go through a credit deflationary event. It's not like we're not going to you know. I, I look at Extra's pyramid and I go, little teeny amount of gold value. Big, huge derivative pile. So asset values have to come down. Gold has to rise. But I don't see a complete flip of the port. I don't that I don't see happening. I think they can manage this. I think you can get fifty percent credit deflation and a seven or a ten x rise in the price of gold, as opposed to ninety percent credit deflation and a fifty x you know move in the price of gold. I think there's 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 that's when I say there's a way out of this. I'm talking about something along those. Like there's no doubt in my mind that gold is going to have to go to twelve, fifteen thousand dollars, or whatever the number is. Could be twenty, could be could be twenty-five, could be seven. It depends. What's important is that, and you know this as well. I know everybody understand understands that markets don't move on fundamentals. They move on momentum and sentiment, and they move on where capital is treated best, even if it's not treated well. We we Austrians, the, the two of us in this room are both Austrians. We both think capital is treated like crap. Mm-hmm. Like that's why we ha- that's the system that's our fundamental cri- criticism of the market, but the market is always going to respond in real time to where it's treated best, and it doesn't mean that that's good, just best. And so, and that's where the marginal f- flows are going to happen. If the United States were to tell the world we're gonna we're gonna pull everything back, we're gonna re- try and restore confidence. And we're going to get, uh, we're getting control of the corruption on Capitol Hill, and you know, fix the balance sheet bubble of the of the country. Stop it trying to engage in world wars and all the rest of it. Again, as of right now, today, that whole idea sounds insane, given where we are right now. Mm-hmm. Okay. But here's the thing: the difference between 2008 and every other banking crisis since 2008. We've had a bunch of them: 2011, 2015, 2019. What not? They've all those are all meltdown scenarios. In every one of those, U.S. banking debt and U.S. debt was all tied to LIBOR. It's not tied to LIBOR anymore. It's tied to SOFR, and SOFR is a different indexing rate. It's a domestic indexing rate and it's a secured indexing rate for debt. Whereas in Europe, so that means that if the European banks catch a cold, it's not going to translate over to your credit card bill. Because your credit card is no longer indexed to LIBOR. It's indexed to SOFR. It's a big shift in the market that no one wants to, that, that everybody who's been in this thing predicting Armageddon, including myself, 
for an awfully long time has not been able to process yet. That there has been a break in the link between offshore dollar markets and onshore dollar markets. And that link is SOFR. And the liquidity in SOFR is rising exponentially as domestic banks have moved into that market on a daily basis because LIBOR and indexing of all debt to LIBOR will all be canceled by the middle of June next year. And as of the beginning of this year, all new debt in the United States has to be indexed to SOFR, not LIBOR. Only legacy debt and all legacy debt that's still indexed to LIBOR at the end of 2023, uh, end of June of 2023, got news for you. They're already telling you, like, you won't be able to re-index the debt. Okay, so because the market uh, will be dead because the U.S. LIBOR market is going to be done. Is going to be done. The U.S. dollar LIBOR market is going to be basically drained of all liquidity. By that. So I think I, I think I understand um, our different perspectives. We have the same conclusion, but we we look from opposite directions, and that's perfectly fine. So um, now let me tell you where I'm where I'm going to reflect back what what you said. I, from what I understood, okay. So yeah, so the market the market puts capital where it's treated best. Yeah, that's true. And it's treated like crap everywhere. Yeah, that's true. But you, you're you're ta- you're speaking, um, I think, entirely from the perspective of the financial um, uh, puppet masters of the universe that have control of huge portions of capital, and they use SOFR or they use LIBOR and these financial terms, which I do understand. But I don't I, I don't like spin these around in my head as fast as you do. I I always go back to the public because who's the ultimate holder of last resort of capital is the public. So when all these financial puppet masters of the universe, whether they be central bank honchos or or the CEO of JP Morgan or commercial banks or whoever it is, IMF, I don't know, whatever they are and whatever buttons they can push, when they they will, my, my thesis is they will lose control and the financial paper they use to represent all the capital of the world will just lose all value. And that's when you have a public run on the currency, which is a hyperinflationary collapse. And everyone and, and all in each public, in each individual of the public says, yeah, you're treating capital like crap. They're not going to use those words because they don't know what that means. And they don't know what SOFR means. And they don't even I have know what a LIBOR even is. But they're going to say, I'm losing my purchasing power. I'm getting rid of all of this financial paper. And because the currency, the, the currency unit is like the second layer of extra's pyramid, they just push off the rest of the pyramid, and what you have left is just gold and a bunch of garbage paper. And that's where you have your new exchange rate. And like, and then all, uh, and, and all the people that control the market today, they have no power anymore. It doesn't matter what they do, LIBOR or SOFR or whatever. It's all worth Well, I, 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 I agree to a certain extent. I just don't think it's going to be that catastrophic. Okay. I agree that, the pro- that that process is what we're going to go through. I just believe that all of these things are processes, not step functions. Because I've, I've, I've been here, I've been doing this way too long. To see, because every time I think there's going to be a step function where we're going to wake up one morning and you know and you know the old world's not going to exist anymore, it never works that way. I mean, I know that's what they want to do. They want to have a great reset where they close down the markets and then a month later everything reopens and we all have to get on the we all have to you know accept CBDCs and we're not allowed to buy you know we're not allowed to buy pizzas because we're fat and all this stuff. I know that's what they want to do. Like what I'm telling, what I'm saying is that. What they're actually doing is laying the, the foundations have actually already been laid to bifurcate these markets in, in in some ways and to protect themselves. Okay, they're trying to protect themselves with these with these things, but at the same time, like there are big forces that are that move the hey, look. It's like everything else. If you re, if you if you change the incentive structure, right, then the family offices will. Be moving their money other places. That's where the uh, the bulk of real capital moves: is in the family offices and the and 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 the and and the, the high net worth investors and what. That's where the real capital moves, right? And those capital flows are always picked up, and you can see them happen. And that's what we have to deal with. And what all I'm not saying that we're going to get out of this without, you know, that there's not going to be a an inflationary, a really bad inflationary event for the United States or for the world. And we're already going through the beginnings of it, right? But the, the U.S. is going to be the last one to collapse. And the U.S. is probably going to collapse in that respect, in the way you described. Potentially, what I'm, what I'm offering is if, they're see, if they can see that and they've laid out certain, um, they've learned, laid out certain infrastructure, then we could actually mitigate the worst of what we're talking about. Because let's not kid ourselves. A 90% collapse of Exeter's Pyramid. Is Mad Max. Okay, I don't. I don't want to go there, and I don't think anybody else who's a rational actor wants to go there. I 
I, I'd like to be proven right, but I don't want to be right at the expense of having to say, yeah, well, you know, that was nuclear Armageddon, you know, that was effectively monetary nuclear Armageddon. And again, I, I'm not, by laying it out this way, what we're actually seeing is a return of some form of monetary sovereignty. It's just not complete monetary sovereignty. I don't think we're going to get a 100% reset back to a full, you know, full 100% gold standard, a la Murray Rothbard, without fractional reserve banking and all the rest of it. Is that what I want? Absolutely. Is that what I think I'm going to get? Absolutely not. And that's, I'm just being a realist and a pragmatist about this because there's just too many competing incentive structures for that to not happen. And I think that the equilibrium point of this is going to be something less catastrophic than, frankly, the many in the gold industry um, are, are willing to admit at this point. And I think some of that is, some of that is, is, I'm not accusing you of this, because I'm actually not accusing you of this at all, uh, of, of running their own, of, of talking their own book and, you know, wanting to be right, the frustration of watching the system limp along far longer than anybody thought they could keep it limped along and limping on. And that's just where we are. And I, I'm like, I'm out of that mode. I'm purely into pragmatic, not the world I want, the world I got mode. Yeah. And that's where I am. Uh -huh. Rough yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So I just want to clear up one thing. I, I see where you're coming from now. And um, I, ho I hope you're wrong. <laughs> I hope you're wrong because I don't want to be limping along for another 10 to 20 years. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm sure like if, if, if I'm right, I'm sure you're protected. Um, but I want to just uh, it it can seem like the way that I talk about things and the way that I think it seems that I'm a pessimist and that I'm predicting Mad Max. But I'm actually I'm actually not. I think I, I think, you know, R Rothbard described hyperinflation as the final defense against uh, against inflationary theft. And and the the way that maybe I'm trying to calm myself or drug myself or, or convince and because, but I, I have to think that everything will be okay, or else I just won't wake up in the morning and take care of my family. So I'm forced into optimism because I'm not a suicidal person, and I don't plan on going there. Uh, so, Rafi, I mean, Rafi, ha, what? Yeah. If I make it, I, I agree. We have to believe. We have to believe there's a way out of this mess. And in a moment, if you finish, I just want to give a brief synopsis of my understanding of Tom's overall overarching thesis. And then it, well, I yeah. think it's time for us to finish up. So do you want to finish what you're about to say? Yeah. So just 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 um, simply like uh, the the way I, I maintain optimism besides faith in God, which is at the core of me. And it, it that's a personal choice. Um, the, the way I see it is that 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 when when you have a financial reset, it's not like like power plants are blown up. It's not like, you know, all of a sudden there's no oil to dig up. All of a sudden, you know, all the physical resources in the world are pretty much the same minus, you know, war. There might be some kind of little bit of war. and But basically, all the physical resources are here. It's just we organized them so wrong, and now we have to figure out who owns them and start again from there. And that's going to take some time. It would take about a year if no government's involved. The problem is if governments get involved and they, they still have some amount of power, it could take a long time. So I'm hoping of a, for a complete governmental collapse, and I don't see Mad Max because I have faith in and humanity, and maybe that's just naive, but that's how I see it, and I'm optimistic. That's all. Very good. well. You're okay where you are in Israel, in Britain, and and Europe. I think is a different scenario, especially with the winter coming, right? Tom? Before you try, before you try to the, remember, also, I'm also the I'm also an optimist. You got to remember that putting all these pieces together is only coming from a, an intense desire to see if there is actually anybody out there, if there are factions that are looking at this going, okay, this is, our, this is, this is a way out that does not require um, the worst possible outcome. And I, 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 and I mean this sincerely because when you really stop to think about how tenuous this, our supply chains are of basic infrastructure, when I think, when I look, there are how many Gen 1 nuclear power plants in this, in this country that have the, whose access to diesel fuel is the only thing keeping us from North America being completely overwhelmed when those things melt down and we have Fukushima 25 times? Because that's what happened to Fukushima. Like the cooling rod pools, couldn't, they couldn't get diesel to run the generators to keep the cooling rod, keep the pools that the cooling rods, spent cooling rods are sitting in. That's the thing that, when I say Mad Max, that's what I mean by Mad Max. Okay? I mean that the, we're so close at a physical infrastructure level to things just completely collapsing. Okay, because it's really, I mean, like Jordan Peterson makes the point all the time. I wake up in the morning and it's a miracle that there's lights on in my house, right? 
because there were men willing to go out there and climb telephone poles to, to you know, climb power poles to restring, to, to keep these things, to keep all these systems running. And the amount of malinvestment that we all see ha- is so endemic, is so enormous that these systems are all teetering on real, honest to God, collapse. Like, I, and the incentives of various players and their power centers and their bailiwicks are so, they're, they're so freaking desperate and so freaking worried about losing power and losing potency that they're willing to, that when they're backed into a corner, they're going to do anything. And if you don't think that tying, that, that, that's not what we're seeing in Ukraine, that's what we're seeing in Ukraine. And from a geopolitical perspective, that's the way I see their, their psychosis playing out in real time. Now the question is, are there other people who see the exact same thing I do and are attempting to figure out ways to stop all of that? And if the, and if the worst thing we have to go through is a credit deflationary environment for four or five years that rem- mirrors the 1970s or the 1930s, and there's a big margin call on the U.S. government's balance sheet and a force of a reset of the price of the gold on the Fed's balance sheet, back to what you talked about at the beginning, you know, talked about earlier, moving it to, you know, to 130% of the value of the, of the debt on the balance sheet. Well, fine. I'm okay with that. The world didn't end when Volcker raised interest rates to 21% and gold went from $35 an ounce or $100 an ounce to $880. And we were on the verge of dollar Armageddon. Like, it's possible. Today, the, the, the numbers are, are higher. But the structure of the market is different today than it was then. The Fed has different tools. The people who are, I think, who are running the Fed have different tools, and they're fighting a different fight. And that's what I've tried to identify. And that's where, and that's what I've been trying to communicate today, and I've been trying to communicate for months. And I don't know if I'm right or not, but every day I seem to be righter than I was the day before. And I, I, so I, I wanted to have this talk in some ways to help make this, you know, real. To another another corner of the same market of you know commentary that I'm already operating in in the first place because if I can co- even half convince you that I'm right, well then you'll go back and go oh, wow that's really interesting. And, and he's so, a lunatic, but he may be right, and you know that would be cool. And then we have communication, and that's the only way we're going to get out of this. And okay, Tom's, I'm done. Tom's thesis, I find optimistic, and this this is this is my understanding of it, right? And I'm, and then I want us to finish up, which is. That uh, the banks that own the New York Fed, not all of them, but most of them, uh, are anti, are hostile to the WEF's Great Reset. Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan do not want to give up commercial banking, so that uh, Klaus Schwab can have central bank digital currencies and cut them out. So what they're doing is they're raising interest rates deliberately in order to destroy the ECB to have capital flow from Europe. And, ro- and destroy the WEF source of funding. There's European elites that are out to depopulate all of us by injecting us with this toxic poison and, and destroying the supply chains and everything else that they're doing to get us so that we can own nothing, they'll own everything, we can eat bugs, whether they're, and they won't be kosher or halal, but we'll just have to be happy with that and they'll own everything. So that, 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 and so they've separated from LIBOR, they've set up SOFA, Capital is draining. The, the euro and the pound are falling because everybody's buying dollars and everybody's screaming, will the Fed pivot? And the Fed is not interested in, pivot, in pivoting because for the Fed, it's a matter of their survival. So you've got a group of gangsters, the Federal Reserve, in a turf war with this other group of gangsters, the WEF, who, are ally, who own and have captured the ECB and the EU. And there's this other group of gangsters on the other side, Russia, and China, these other gangsters that don't want to get involved, but don't want to get hurt either. That's overall. Tom, you're on mute. Any, anything you want to say about that, uh, Rafi? Um, sure. Um, well, okay. So may, maybe as quickly as possible. Maybe maybe there are these like this is a huge game of chess going on. And I, it, okay, I'll, I'll just concede that it's going on. Even if it's going on, everything you're saying is right. I don't think that the power ultimately rests in these huge financial interests in these turf wars. Um, I think the, the power is ultimately held in so, Rafi, you frozen in the end. At what? So you, you, ultimately, you frozen. Ultimately, you think the power is 
is held by ultimately the power is in the hands of the public and they're the ones that will rebel against the derivatives of all these uh, gangsters and um and you know to to close on on a biblical note again it's the it's the holiday of the feast of tabernacles here in israel and for jews around the world and uh that is the holiday if you look in the end of the book of zechariah zechariah maybe you call it um it's about a giant war where everyone brings their gold and silver to jerusalem and dukes it out and uh and it's figurative i don't know exactly what it means but it's supposed to happen on sukkot on the Feast of Tabernacles. Maybe it's happening now, probably not, who knows, but it's interesting and, and the world is as boring as ever. <laughs> That's right. I, and, oh no, and, and I agree And I agree with you, Rocky. We ultimately have the power. So my, yeah. my point is we do not give into despair. We try to understand the parameters of the game that's being played around us. We are, while the giants fight, they're eventually gonna knock each other out. And if we can avoid being stepped on, we're the next generation of giants. Yep. Okay. And what there is for us to do is to keep stacking gold, keep stacking exactly. silver. And oh, Ruffy and I have talked about this. We don't agree, right? But that's fine. You stack gold, stack gold, silver, and stack Bitcoin and privacy. Stack that's because you, you stack. Need, because you need movable capital in a world where capital controls are coming. Yeah. And it's, you know, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of both. I've been telling people I'm, I'm, I'm agnostic on this. You should own some gold, you should own some Bitcoin. And right now, since this is the big bull market, you should own dollars. And it may be anathema to you, and you may not like it, but own some dollars. Because I'm not saying you should, you know, but, but gold is below $1,700 an ounce. You're an idiot if you're not buying. Like I said, I bought some this morning before we started we hit record. Yep. Okay. Rafi, Tom, thank you both very, very much. Uh, I look forward to having you on again my channel. Uh, at some point in the future. If you're watching this, you have any comments or questions, put them in the description below. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say at the beginning, if you're going to watch this on YouTube, you're not going to see the whole thing. So you should follow me on Odyssey, where I post most of my material, all my material, and I post most of my material on, on 3Speak, which is also a censorship resistant platform. Thank you guys. Much, much appreciated. And between now and when I see you next, please keep filling your pockets with gold, silver, and Bitcoin. This is this is gold, uh, gold Tom and silver Ruffy. And Crypto Rich signing out. All the best. Bye-bye. All right.